Welcome everyone to our webinar on managing safety in an office environment. Uh, my name is James, I'm a practice group leader um, in our employment team here at Legal Vision and I'm joined today by my colleague Atticus, he's a lawyer in our team. Uh, before we get started, um, just a quick um, few housekeeping items. Um, you'll receive a copy of the webinar and the recording and the slides afterwards. Um, throughout, please submit any questions that you've got. Um, you can do that in the chat box there. Um, we'll have an opportunity at the end to answer those. And there'll also be a survey um, at the end. We would be very grateful if you would please um, fill out that survey. We try and make these webinars as useful as possible. Um, helpful for you and for your business. Um, and so any feedback we're getting in the survey is gonna help us make them better and better. So please do fill out that survey. Um, attendees are also eligible to receive a complimentary consultation. Um, that's really to identify any gaps in your legal compliance. So um, to request um, that sort of free health check, um, you can leave your contact details with us in the survey that appears at the end. Okay, so uh, today, in terms of what we'll be discussing, um, an overview of your obligations. So actually, what does the law say around your safety obligations? Identifying physical risk um, in an office, identifying non-physical risk in an office, um, and then how to maintain um, compliance, ongoing management of those risks. And as I mentioned, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, so we'll answer some of your questions at the end and, and please do submit those questions along the way through that chat function. All right, let's just get straight into it. Um, and I'll start with explaining your WHS obligations. So model WHS laws were developed by SafeWork um, in around 2011, and that was to improve consistency of WHS standards um, really across Australia. So all Australian states and territories have implemented the exact same WHS laws, um, except for Victoria, they still maintain an OHS law, um, which is effectively the same as what everyone else has, which is one of the reasons for them not adopting the model laws. Um, Anyone in Victoria will still get a lot of value out of this because those laws are the same, but we're going to be using the language WHS as opposed to OHS, um, which is still what's used in Victoria. WHS laws impose duties on persons conducting a business or undertaking, so that's a PCBU, um, officers and senior managers of those businesses, and then workers themselves. A PCBU covers any kind of business, um, so sole traders, companies, partnerships, unincorporated bodies, associations. Um, P P PCBU is a really broad um, term, so everyone here running a business is a PCBU. Um, a PCBU has the primary duty of care to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, and we'll come back to that phrase, um, ensure so far as is reasonably practicable the health and safety of workers and others in the workplace. Um, this obligation basically includes providing, maintaining safe, um, a safe workplace, um, safe plants so or equipment, structures, systems of work, um, safe use, handling, storage of um, equipment, plant structures, substances, um, making sure there's adequate and accessible facilities for the welfare of the workers, um, making sure there's training, um, information, instruction and supervision, which is necessary to maintain a healthy and safe workplace. That's really important, particularly in an office environment, um, as we'll get to later, management, culture, supervision, feedback, those things are critical for safety in an office environment. Um, and PCBUs also have to monitor the health of workers and those conditions in the workplace. All right, I mentioned the term reasonably practicable. The critical aspect of this obligation is really how far do you have to go? Um, the PCBU's duty is to do what is reasonably practicable. Now that means that a small business would need to take different steps from say a large corporation um, to ensure there was a safe working environment. Um, uh, it also means that some risks might need to be fully eliminated where others don't. So there are quite a few factors that, that are relevant to determine what is actually reasonably practicable in the circumstance. So the likelihood um, of the hazard or risk occurring, there are some risks in a business which may be very unlikely um, to occur. 
and therefore the amount of effort, expense, time that you need to go to in reducing or minimising that risk may be less because it's very unlikely to occur. Couple that with the degree of harm that might result from the hazard or risk. Um, so if it's unlikely to occur, and if it did occur, it was only going to bring about a very, very small um, hazard, um, well then you're probably not required to do very much um, to respond to that risk. Equally, if it occurred and the result was catastrophic, um, then you'd be more likely to, to or be required to, to spend more um, on that. Knowledge about the hazard or the risk or ways of managing it. So safe work um, and their regulators in every state and territory um, will put out information that tells businesses effectively what is known about different risks. Um, so you can't really hide behind the fact that, oh, well, we didn't know that was actually a problem um, when Safe Work has put out material. And critically for what a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, um, Safe Work has put out now a lot of material on psychosocial hazards. And these are really non-physical risks which are prevalent in a lot of office-based environments. Um, so we'll get to that, but there's no longer a defence here that, well, we didn't know these things were a risk because Safe Work is now making it very clear to everyone that there are lots of non-physical risks in offices. Um, the availability and suitability of options to eliminate or minimise the risk, well, sure, that's all about what's actually available there to you. And finally, cost. Um, so obviously, if it's going to be very expensive, to get rid of or to eliminate or minimise a, a very minor risk which is unlikely to occur, you're probably not expected to do it. Um, equally, if there's an easy and quick fix um, to, to eliminate or to minimise a risk, then the law is going to expect you to do something. So officers, we want to talk about as well, they're people um, who make decisions that have an impact on the whole or substantial part of a business. Um, they're usually your senior managers and maybe your C-suite executives, so very senior people in the business. They have obligations in their personal capacity and they have to exercise due diligence to ensure that the company or employer, the PCBU, um, complies with their its WHS duties. So the officers can meet their WHS duties. Um, they need to take reasonable steps to keep up to date with their WHS knowledge. Um, so things like attending this webinar is a really helpful thing for, um, for officers to be able to say we're staying up to date on WHS matters. Um, understanding what risks are in the business, um, ensuring that the business has got the, the right resources and processes in place to actually respond and manage those risks, um, and then ensuring that there's the right reporting processes um, in the business. So senior managers need to remember um, they've got obligations in their personal capacity too. And finally, uh, workers themselves. So workers are your employees, your contractors, apprentices, trainees. Um, everyone is actually carrying out work for a PCBU as a worker and workers have their own obligations at law. They need to look after their own health and safety. Um, they need to take reasonable care for others' health and safety. They need to comply with reasonable instructions given by the PCBU. So they're actually obliged at law to follow those instructions and they've got to cooperate with any of your reasonable policies um, or procedures that you might have notified to them. So it's always if you've got workers who are not really taking health and safety seriously, um, it can be very useful to be able to give them a reminder um, that they are obliged at law to comply with what you're requiring of them. So that's an overview really of, um, of the sort of the, the important obligations at each level down the chain. Um, it's worth then taking a look at, well, okay, how do you identify risks um, in the context of managing safety in an office environment? And for that, uh, I'll hand over to Atticus. Thanks very much for that, James. So with those obligations in mind, um, let's have a look at how they're relevant in the office environment. Now, these examples that I'll step through are, of course, by no means exhaustive um, and will, of course, depend on the individual circumstances of each employer and their office premises. So you, um, you have a number of risks in an office um, to think about. The first one I want to step through is ergonomic risks. So these are risks associated with uh, the workstation used by your employees in their office, things like chairs, desks, monitors, the location of, of any other accessories. Um, if they're incorrectly set up, they can cause issues like eye strain, RSI, um, repetitive strain injuries, or musco, 
uh, musculoskeletal injuries as well. Having workers complete an ergonomic assessment and utilising equipment that is adjustable, um, they're sort of things that can be done and reasonable steps that can be taken to minimise these risks. The, the second risk is electrical risks. Um, this could be caused by computers and, and other equipment with power cables. These risks could be uh, a trip hazard or, or malfunctions with the actual um, electric equipment themselves causing shocks or, or fires. Regular inspections um, and things like test and tag systems can reduce risks in this respect. Um, and in regards to the, the sort of common office electrical equipment that you'd experience. Um, the, the third is risks associated with office kitchens. So uh, things like kettles, um, the sort of zip taps that deliver boiling water, toasters, microwaves, sandwich presses, um, any other sorts of um, common appliances, perhaps coffee machines, those sorts of things, they all present um, personal injury risks to employees. Um, steps that can be taken there are ensuring safety signage is displayed and regularly emptying and cleaning fridges and freezers um, things like that can assist with managing risk in, in the office. Uh, the fourth category is the thermal comfort and associated risks. I, I think this can be overlooked from time to time, but work should be carried out in an office environment that provides appropriate comfort for, for workers, um, and that's in all seasons, um, whether it's a, a colder winter or a, a warmer summer. This comfort can be utilised um, by way of things like air conditioners, fans, windows, um, electric heating, um, utilising insulation, um, and, and otherwise um, sort of non-appliance techniques such as controlling airflow or, or directing um, sunlight as necessary. Um, the final um, category, um, as I said, not exhaustive, um, but working alone and or after hours. So the, the risks in this context could be related to being alone in the event of an incident, um, and, and those incidents could be associated with one of the previous examples that I've just set through. Um, or, or the other consideration would be personal safety risks that do exist from time to time outside of, of business hours. Um, in addition to the, the physical risks I've just set through, um, it, it's also really important for employers to identify and manage non-physical risks to safety in the office environment as well. The backdrop to this is the growing number of claims that we have seen arising from a mental health perspective. Now, non-physical risks are often referred to as psychosocial hazards, and psychosocial hazards are aspects of work and situations that may cause a stress response in workers, which in turn can lead to psychological or even physical harm. They include circumstances such as bullying, um, harassment, poor job support or lack of control, and they typically create psychological harm. This harm could be in the form of things like anxiety, um, depression, um, perhaps PTSD or, or even sleep disorders as well. The, the common psychosocial hazards that may arise in an office environment um, include a variety of things. Um, it could be workplace stress arising from job demands and, and high workloads, for example, insufficient time or, or resources to actually complete tasks. Um, a, a good question to ask is, do your workers have the tools they need to actually do their job properly? Um, it, it could also be exposure to emotionally taxing work um, or, or having things like unachievable deadlines or, or expectations placed upon workers. Another example is low job control. Um, this could include where a worker has very little control over how they actually perform their day-to-day -day work and, and when tasks um, can be varied or, or when they're able to take breaks or, or things like that. Um, another example is um, poor support. So this um, often is in the form of, of um, the context of from managers or, or supervisors. Um, for example, receiving unreasonable feedback, um, not being provided with the, the adequate information and resources to, to do their job, um, or perhaps more generally speaking, not having the right tools or, or access to information or, or systems to be able to do their job well. Another example is a lack of role clarity. Um, this could be in situations where there is overlapping responsibilities, where specific roles and reporting lines are unclear between different workers, or where priorities for competing tasks are unclear, um, particularly if those tasks are very important or, or urgent or are working to very tight deadlines. 
another example, uh, poor organisational change management. Um, so we're, we're finding at the moment that many businesses are going through um, significant periods of change and, and risks can arise here where businesses aren't properly consulting on those changes or the changes are poorly communicated and are not accompanied by the right level of support for workers. Uh, another example is inadequate reward or, or recognition. So this could be where employees deem um, the rewards uh, provided by a workplace could be un unfair or, or biased or where a worker's skills uh, are not recognised, perhaps uh, where feedback is, is lacking or, or negative. So uh, an example in that respect would be a lack of guidance on how to improve or, or perhaps criticism for something that is outside of a worker's control. Another example is traumatic events. So that could be witnessing um, or, or perhaps investigating a serious inc incident such as fatality or abuse um, or, or something um, traumatic like that as part of uh, the actual job that a worker is performing. Another example could be isolated work. So where there's no immediate access to, to colleagues or supervisors or being alone in the event of an emergency, um, as I stepped through earlier. Um, some, uh, some harmful behaviours are another example as well. So we're talking about things like violence and aggression, um, workplace bullying, uh, or any discrimination or harassment um, that may take place in the workplace as well. Um, uh, another example is the poor physical environment um, that, that could exist. Now, this creates a psychosocial hazard when that poor physical environment is severe or, or frequent. So uh, e examples in this case could be things like performing a hazardous tasks, such as working from heights, exposure to unsafe or, or poorly maintained machinery or things like hazardous chemicals or unpleasant conditions. So that could be issues with amenities or perhaps the, the frequent use of PPE um, or, or that PPE not being adequate or, or not being comfortable enough and, and adjusted enough. Um, uh, another example is conflict. So this would be um, in the form of poor workplace relationships or, or interactions between colleagues or between managers as well. Now, in light of those examples I've given, um, an important question to ask is what drives these risks? So there are many aspects of a business that can create psychosocial risk, but typically these risks can come from um, the design or management of work. So that's the way in which individual tasks are designed for a worker um, or, or how the job as a whole is, is organized and supervised. Um, another um, driver is the specific work environment. So are the so, sorry, psychosocial hazards uh, and risks, are they inherent to a particular task or role? Um, the plant and equipment could drive things uh, in terms of the working environment or the need to undertake duties um, in environments that are, are physically hazardous. Um, or as I mentioned before as well, another key driver is the social elements of day-to-day of -day work. So those sort of workplace relationships and interactions, whether it be with, um, as I suggested before, colleagues or, or managers or perhaps with clients or, or other people who um, you work with as well in the day-to-day -day, um, workplace. Um, now look, in light of that, um, I'll hand back over to James now um, just to discuss um, how to manage these risks and, and the key tips for compliance in a WHS um, perspective as well. Thanks Atticus. Yeah, so look, in order to ensure your compliance and manage sort of all these risks, uh, many, many risks and hazards which, you know, Atticus has just walked through um, with the end goal of, I guess, maintaining a safe office environment, um, you really need to put in ultimately a systematic process. Um, there's a lot there. You want to make sure you're doing something um, and so that if you've got a, an actual process in place, you're going to be making sure that you're able to identify those risks and do something about them. So Safe Work Australia has a model code of practice. Um, it provides um, these steps, which we've got up there, um, that can actually assist you with meeting those compliance obligations. So number one, identify your hazards um, and do that with a thorough assessment of the business. Now, whether that's physical, non-physical um, or both, 
you can find out what it is that could cause harm in the business. Now, the ways to actually go and identify those risks, well, you know, the first thing is inspecting the workplace for hazards, um, and that's both your physical and, and non-physical hazards. Um, so that's, that can literally be a matter of walking around and, and looking throughout your business um, to see what's there. You can have that done by a professional third party or you can do it yourself. Um, consulting workers and, and your suppliers about health and safety issues. If you've got an ongoing dialogue with your workers, they're going to help you identify any risks within your business. If you have a culture of people who don't feel like they can raise issues, it's gonna make it very hard for you to identify risks. They will all become very hidden. Um, do your research, reviewing available um, information and advice about hazards. We can help you with a lot of that. Um, and if you're not using us, SafeWork also has a lot of material um, that you can look at, um, which can sort of educate you about hazards that might be associated um, with business, what it, and particularly a lot of their guidance is industry specific. Um, so you can find material that's gonna be very specific and useful to you. Um, and of course, yes, you can go and, and, and take advice from a um, consultant or a specialist, um, both in relation to physical and non-physical risks, if you're trying to identify them. Number two there is assess the risk. So you're gonna to wanna to understand the level of harm that could actually be caused by the hazard that you've identified. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you're looking at your obligations, um, you don't have to eliminate every single risk in your business. It's not possible to, and the law is sensible enough here um, to not ask you to just wants you to minimise or eliminate them to the extent to which is reasonably practicable. And you need to know what level of harm could come from a risk in order to know how much you're going to need to, now number three, control the risk. Um, so again, how much are you going to do? Um, how much time, energy, um, money are you going to put into um, minimising or, or eliminating a particular risk? Um, well that's your control aspect. Um, the upshot here is you've got to be doing something. If something goes wrong, um, you don't want to then be asked by a regulator, okay, well, what steps did you take to minimise or eliminate this risk and respond to them with nothing? As long as you've done something, you have the beginnings of an argument to say you've been complying with your legal obligations. So having a process in place, um, having some kind of you know WHS system um, where, which might include, you know, training your senior managers, training your workers, um, having ongoing internal reporting structures in place, um, carrying out risk assessments, doing all of those things. If you have all of that in place, anytime a regulator comes knocking on your door, you're going to then have something to say and say, this is how we ensured to the extent to which was reasonably practicable health and safety, notwithstanding that there may have been an incident. The law is not about no incidents. The law is about doing something. Finally, you need to review your control measures. So it's not a set and forget. Um, you can't just say, yes, we've put in a WHS policy and that's the end of it. Um, you'll always need to consider and improve the control measures that you've put in place because risks might change. Um, what we know about particular risks might change. Um, and so this is a live ongoing um, compliance piece for your business. Um, so keep reviewing it. Um, and, and ensuring that the controls you put in place are still adequate. Okay, so it's, it's also important to note that PCBUs have got obligations to monitor the conditions of work um, in, the, in the environment and, and the facilities like your office, which is what we're talking about today, um, to ensure everyone's health and safety. I think the effectiveness of compliance really turns on two key issues. Um, Number one is leadership and number two is consultation. So leadership in this space is, is best achieved by ensuring managers are aware of their duties under WHS laws, um, where they understand that they may have obligations in their personal capacity, they tend to engage a little more comprehensively with these issues. Then engage leaders tend to and drive, they drive engaged workers. Um, and this really can improve the, the positive culture um, in a workplace um, in regards to all things safety. That's your key piece. Your, your managers are going to drive this for you. Now, consultation is a requirement under the WHS laws. Um, 
And it's simple in relation to managing physical risk in a workplace and that's say seeking feedback or input from workers around safety is really often uncontroversial. You know, a lot of businesses have toolbox meetings and um, site safety meetings, all those types of things, um, talk about the physical risks, it's simple stuff. In relation to psychosocial risk, well, the nature of the risk can often be quite personal or private, um, maybe subject to some kind of stigma. And that often means there's hesitation to discuss it from a worker perspective. Um, so there are, there are ways to still consult and make sure you're doing it effectively. Um, and you, you can often just make you know, the, an allowance for some kind of more anonymous survey, or you can do surveys, anonymous surveys. Um, you can do toolbox meetings. You can just have discussions. Um, you can have WHS committee meetings, um, and you can have one-on-one -on -one catch up discussions, um, managers to workers. Now where you've got managers who are leading in this space and creating an environment where workers are happy and comfortable to talk about these issues, knowing that they're not going to be victimized for raising issues, knowing that they can safely raise issues, um, then, then you're going to create an environment where it becomes actually quite easy for you to identify res uh, risk in the business. Um, so with, with that, they're the key points that we want to um, work through. Um, and I'll hand back um, now to Atticus. Thanks very much for that, James. Um, that concludes the main part of the webinar. Um, you might find our publication useful, Safety Essentials for SMEs. You can download that via the handout section in the webinar panel, um, which is on your screen, um, or also by scanning the QR code, which is on the screen there as well. We've got uh, an upcoming webinar um, at Legal Vision, which could be of interest to you. Um, this is how to raise capital from overseas investors. That's on Thursday, the 1st of June at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, we're going to answer your questions shortly. Um, while you submit those, um, we might just take a minute to tell you about um, Legal Vision's membership. Our membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates that you might experience with other law firms. For an affordable monthly fee, um, you receive some, some cost certainty um, and all-inclusive legal services. Um, so this includes things like unlimited document review, which includes drafting, amending and reviewing business contracts or employment contracts and commercial leases. It includes unlimited advice consultations with our team of 100 plus specialist lawyers. This includes areas such as business structuring, employment, disputes, um, and many more, and unlimited domestic trademark registrations as well. Legal Vision members can also subscribe to our WHS advisory service um, that provides specific advice and assistance that will help you meet your WHS compliance obligations. Legal Vision membership is like having your own in-house counsel. We'll take care of all the business as usual legal work so you can focus on running your own business. Um, if you are an in-house counsel, our membership is also a cost-effective solution for outsourcing any additional legal work that you may have. To learn more about how our membership can help you, um, you can request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of the webinar. Um, and now we'll, we'll answer some of your questions. Um, uh, the first one, um, James, um, what about working from home and safety in home offices? Yeah, good question. Um, so everything we've talked about today in terms of your obligations as a business, they will still apply to your workers when they work from home. Um, so just because someone's in a different office doesn't mean you're no longer um, uh, required at law to ensure to the extent which is reasonably practicable, their health and safety. Now it's that reasonably practicable point which becomes really important here when you're talking about people working from home because there is very obviously a limit uh, to how much control you can exert um, on them um, when they're in their own home and not in your office. You don't really control the space. Um, and so you're not obliged at law to, you know, to go to their house and sit next to them um, and make sure that there are no risks um, in place. There are things you can do though. It doesn't mean again, you, you can do nothing. Um, a common approach for, and this is what we do for a lot of our clients um, who want to just make sure that, um, you know, they're not exposing themselves when they've allowed people to work from home, um, which is, you know, the vast majority of our businesses for obvious reasons recently have had people working from home. Um, it, 
is to provide them with a work from home checklist. Now that effectively requires that employee to go and assess their space. Um, it asks them a, a, a lot of questions, um, but some of them are things like, look, is there adequate lighting? Is there adequate heating? Um, are there trip hazards in place? So are there loose cords? Um, you know, are you working on a proper office chair or are you working on the dining room table? Um, are you folded up in half on the couch, you know, with Netflix on the screen um, and working off your laptop and going to get a neck injury or a back injury? Um, those types of things. So once the employee actually works through that, they look at their space and they say, yeah, there are some cords here. I'll clean those up. OK, now there are no trip hazards. Um, now I've got the screen at the correct height. Um, I've got my arms at the, the correct angle, all of those things, I'm sitting on a proper chair, then an employer will be able to say, well, actually, I have insured to the extent to which is reasonably practicable, given that I'm not there in the house and I'm not expected to be, um, that they're working in a safe environment. Um, so all of those things apply. And then when we talk about a lot of those other things, um, the, the job design, um, all those psychosocial issues, they're all still very prevalent too when people are working from home. Um, it's very common for people to, you know, sort of experience stress from um, being isolated, not included. Um, sometimes it can be very hard for managers to make sure that they're managing people effectively when those people are at home, whether that's because they are forgotten, whether it's because they become hard to contact. Um, so giving that kind of regular um, informal feedback can become a little bit tricky. So those things are definitely very relevant and need to be considered. Um, so as part of your risk assessment, when you look at those psychosocial issues, including things like working um, from isolation or looking at the structure of a particular job, um, you would factor in that they are working from home and consider whether that is actually creating any um, any risk to health and safety. Um, you know, what could you do about it? Well, do you just need to schedule some more meetings so that there's a greater level of inclusiveness, something like that, or just check in. It doesn't mean you have to go fundamentally change your whole business, um, but absolutely everything we've talked about today, still very relevant for, for working from home. Thanks, James. Um, next question. This is in the context of psychosocial hazards or, or non-physical risks. Um, the question is, are these examples, interpretations or, or specifically listed in law? As a business owner, it is becoming increasingly difficult to engage with employees due to these demands and expectations on employees, which in most case listed could be interpreted as incredibly unreasonable. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot being put on employers here. So the first part of that question, yes, they're, they're now in law in terms of those when we talk about uh, work structure, um, support in a role, um, isolation, all of those psych psychosocial um, hazards that were listed on the slide there, yes, they're, they're part of the law now. Um, they're not just general things to think about. Um, and that's because the law recognises that what Safe Work publishes about these um, uh, these risks um, then can be taken as evidence of what is known about these risks. I think the key thing for businesses that are uh, that are feeling like this can be very onerous and that's it's a very very common a lot of our clients um, can sort of pull their hair out a lot um, when trying to handle what's an ever what feels like an ever increasing um, sort of burden on employers um, in terms of looking after their employees is to always come back to that obligation at the start around what is reasonably practicable. Now, if you were to take an assessment of, of your business and carry out your risk assessment and determine that, well, sure, all of those things are factors that create risk, um, but they're not actually causing risk to health and safety, um, and certainly not in any sort of obvious way, um, the law understands that, you know, people will get sick when they're working. They will develop mental um, uh, health issues when they're working. That doesn't mean the employer has failed um, or that there's a breach of the law. The law is not designed that way. The law just wants to make sure that you're you're doing something um, and that if there are obvious risks being, being um, brought to your attention, that particularly in that instance, you're doing something. So if you've got a workforce that's, you know, generally humming along okay, you know, you don't have 
dangerous managers who are bullying people. Um, you don't have consistent reports of people going on long-term sick leave, putting their hands up saying, I'm just overworked and I'm burnt out and this is all too much. Um, then you're probably not necessarily sitting in a particularly high risk category. Nonetheless, you want to go through the process of making those assessments, documenting it, just so you can always be ready to defend um, any kind of allegation that you haven't done enough into health and safety. So again, I think a lot of this comes back to having a process in place um, and knowing that it's not a system that says, oh, if there's any illness or injury, that means we've breached the law. That's just not the case. Um, so key takeaway is, is do something and you'll, you'll be more comfortable comfortable that, um, that the business is in a good spot from a compliance perspective. Thanks, James. Um, another question. What are the roles and obligations of highly paid employees who should have a very, very strong grasp of their role requirements and what would be expected of them? Yeah, so that look, the all of those things get factored in. Um, if someone's quite senior in their role um, and you've been clear about the expectations that you've put on them, um, then then it's probably not the type of thing that, that when the law is looking at that arrangement that they would think, well, there's some kind of um, uh, there's some kind of breach of, of the WHS requirements here. Um, if you're in a situation where that person was continually feeding back to you that they don't understand what the requirement is, um, well, you probably couldn't rely on the fact just that they're highly paid um, for them uh, to, to suggest that, well, they, they ought know. Um, but equally, when we come back to this reasonably practicable um, obligation here, if you've been very clear, and particularly if you can document it, you know, if you've got a role description and position description, uh, if you've made it very clear in sort of written directions, this is what we're asking of you and this is what we expect of you, then when we take into account your obligation to do what is reasonably practicable, the fact that this is a highly paid senior person with lots of experience um, becomes becomes relevant. It is absolutely relevant um, because that should be enough uh, in terms of um, you could be comfortable that that person would be able to understand your email um, and understand the position description, understand the directions which are being made. Obviously, by contrast, you've had a very junior person who was still just, you know, it's their first job um, out of school or out of university, still really trying to understand, you know, um, the, you know, even just how to how to get by in an office. Well, sure, you may need to be a little bit more patient with those people. So I guess upshot there is yes, the fact that they're senior is is actually relevant. The fact that highly paid is relevant. Uh, you still got to be doing something, um, and you still like to have, particularly if you can have it in writing, very clear direction. Um, but ultimately, if they're not getting it and you've been clear, then then that's on them, not on you. Um, so you can be confident there. Um, uh, next question, uh, since COVID, are ventilation or air filtering upgrades seen as a minimum safety requirement? Um, are you aware of any cases that are testing this? Interesting. Um, I'm not aware of any cases um, that, are, that are testing that. Um, it's definitely, and so no, it's not a minimum requirement. Um, it's not the expectation that every single business will have gone through and upgraded those things, but it absolutely is something um, to consider. So most businesses would have in place a COVID plan. So when COVID came, that was, okay, here's a very obvious risk to health and safety in our business. So what are we going to do? Now, when we look again, coming back to the obligation to do what's reasonably practicable, for most businesses, it was reasonably practicable to, um, at a minimum, say, all right, well, we're going to make hand sanitizer available. We're going to maybe require wearing masks in the office. If we can space people out, we'll do that. These are all really simple things. You know, a lot of businesses started rotating people through in their office environments and said, all right, your team can come in one day, you can come the next day. Um, they might have improved the cleaning or the frequency of the cleaning um, of the office. Um, so those might have been things which were sort of easy wins, the sanitizer, the, um, the the masks, all of those types of things. They're cheap um, and as far as we understand, they're effective. Um, if you were to then look at, say, upgrading an air filtration system, it depends on your business and it depends on the risk. Um, so 
if your business has has all the cash in the world um, to put in an, a new air filtration system or doing so wasn't actually that expensive, then yes, it might be expected of you to do it. Um, but that's also got to be considered in the context of what risk does COVID pose? Um, and increasingly, risk the risk of COVID is less and less, um, certainly as far as the regulators are, are considered. Um, and there are other factors that make it less and less, including now we have much higher vaccination um, levels. Um, so at a time where people were unvaccinated, that was then a much higher risk and you might've been need, required to do more about it. So. That's probably a good point to remind everyone on why ongoing um, sort of assessment of your control um, uh, of your control measures becomes really important um, because risks will change, and so with COVID, the risk has changed. So, yeah, look, coming back to that, I guess the overview here is no, it's not an express requirement. It's not expected of every business to go and do that. Equally, if there are ways to do it, if your landlord's doing a new fit out and you can put some pressure on them to to upgrade that, well, sure, it might be a really effective thing to do, um, but no express obligation to do it. And there are lots of other ways um, that you can respond to the risk that COVID um, poses in your workplace. Um, and again, having a plan in place, having all of those things documented um, will be really effective for you. Thanks. All right. Um, I just feel... um, time for one more, Atticus. Yeah, I think a final question here. Um, who is responsible for safety in the workplace environment? Yeah, okay. So. Look, that's that's it. Uh, I think that's going back to what we discussed at the beginning. There, um, ultimately, it's the business. The PCBU has the ultimate responsibility. The senior managers um, they need to ensure that the PCBU is complying with its obligations, and workers themselves. So the answer to that question is everyone. Um, but you know, mostly it's going to be business owners and senior managers here um, joining us today. Um, and you'll certainly all have have your own obligations and very important then to make sure, um, sort of as we've been discussing there, have something in place, um, have a have a plan in place that you, you, you give some consideration to on an ongoing basis. All right, I think um, that's probably all we've got time for. Sorry for anyone with the questions we didn't get to uh, at the end there. As we mentioned, um, uh, there'll be a survey that's going to pop up. Um, so it'd be really um, appreciative if you can complete that. I think it's about 30 seconds. Um, you can include your contact details to receive a complimentary WHS legal health check. We'll have a look at your business's um, safety needs. And that may be something if we haven't got to your question today, or obviously if there are other things which pop up um, as you're digesting what we've discussed today, um, consider using that complimentary consultation as an opportunity to ask a few more questions. We're very happy to chat to you. Um, so thanks again uh, today for joining us and we'll see you next time.